All right. How's it going? I'm going to give a few minutes uh, for people to join in and share out the feed. How's it going out there? Already got someone? We're going to get started here in a minute. I'm going to share out the link on Twitter. We're going to get started here in a minute. Just to include everyone. So we'll give a couple minutes here for people to join in. How's it going, Richard? All right, sharing out the link on Twitter right now. Just to include everyone. I didn't give a lot of notice for this one, so I expect a lot of people to catch the replay. So I'm almost queued up here. So this is going to be the Resurrection Appearances Part 1 and 2. Hey, super duper mate, back at ya. Good to have you on. Represent the other side of the world, the underside. <clears throat> okay, so I pushed out a new blog today called The Resurrection Appearances. It's called Eyewitnesses, Visions, or Hallucinations. So, part two here is going to be largely built upon what Pannenberg writes about in his Systematic Theology, Volume 2 on the Resurrection. He really believes that we can get behind the Resurrection accounts. Maybe not behind, but we can get our hand on it. And when we get our hands on it, we can really see what's going on. It's not that we are, like, getting behind the resurrection appearances described in the New Testament as if we we're constructing a life of Jesus that the New Testament doesn't tell us we're going to uncover the conspiracy. It's more about reading the different accounts together and trying to really understand what's going on. So in this part two in this series I'm working on, hey Sean, thanks for joining in. Good to see you. In this part two, I pushed out a post today on the postbargain.com um, whether these appearances that are described in the New Testament are are they eyewitnesses? Are they visions? Are they hallucinations? Hey Sean, yeah, the poll the poll still uh, in play. It seems like about seventy five percent of the people really think that it's eyewitnesses. I don't, I'm not really surprised by that because there's such a, I don't know, swamp of material out there that is like evidence that demands a verdict, you know, the case for Christ, and other terrible movies that are made based on that now, that I think people make assumptions about what the New Testament says. So we see all kinds of terrible literature, this really disappointing stuff. It's really hard to understand what is actually communicated to us in those post-resurrection accounts that we have in the New Testament. So what I really want to get at with this series is why don't we actually read what it says and try to understand it and not be afraid to talk about certain things because there's a little bit of fear when we approach the resurrection appearances that we don't get in other parts of the Bible. I think people are okay when they talk about Genesis to say, oh, you know, Genesis 1 and 2, they're talking about Babylonian mythology, and this is really primitive or prehistoric. But when you get into the resurrection appearances, this is kind of hitting home for a lot of people that they feel really uncomfortable talking about them because you're getting into like the core of the faith. And anytime someone says there might be a myth or contradiction or legend or some sort of aspect of that that's going on in the New Testament resurrection appearances, people freak out. And I don't really blame people. Uh, for freaking out, especially the way that it's presented to us. So what I'm really getting at in this Resurrection Appearances series is 
what are they and what are we reading and what should we make of them? They're really important and people are afraid to talk about them. Okay, so I'm going to get into the actual post of it. Uh, I, I see we've got about six people have jumped on by now um, and talk about the latest in this installment. So I'm kind of looking at what I wrote today as I'm talking about it. But if you guys have any questions or just want to say hello, just go ahead and let me know that you're listening. And I'm glad to take a time out and just talk about those things. So what we have today that I really want to get into is what is what are these accounts that we have in the New Testament? We have um, all these disparate accounts of people who saw something. And what do we make of what they saw? How do we understand that today, 2,000 years later? I'm in the Seattle area, so I'm other side of the earth from where this was done. So I feel really distant from them, and I think most people do. So what I wanted to get at is how do we read these accounts? So we have a lot of different people telling us about them. And in the New Testament, I've selected the three reports of Paul. So Paul uh, has this amazing Damascus Road experience. It's not like, hey, I you know bumped into Jesus on the way to Lebanon or Syria, and I, he said hello. He's you know walking down the road, or he's riding his donkey, and he gets like stoned off his donkey, or some other euphemisms you might want to draw off of that, and he can't see. He's blinded by this light experience that he's had. This vision comes upon him. <laughs> Saul, Saul, why are you kicking against the goads? And everyone with him is totally freaking out. They hear something, or they see something, or they don't see something, and they don't hear something. But something's going on that's really above all of them. And it's recorded three times in Acts of the Apostles. And each of them are a little bit different in the way they tell it. And Paul's whole experience has a lot in common with what we see in the gospel accounts, especially, you know, Mark and Luke, you know, somewhat Matthew and John also. But it is a little bit different at the same time of what they've encountered. Uh, for instance, with Paul, Jesus shows up from heaven in this light metaphor, um, a blinding light. It's it's a you have enlightenment metaphors. It's a little bit anachronistic to call it enlightenment, but the Greek words there. Even John uses the word enlightenment in John one, in a different sense than we understand, like the French enlightenment. But still, the idea of that the light of God is not appeared to him. It's as if Jesus appeared from heaven, showed up to Paul, and then vanished back up in heaven again. And you see that, and I think I referenced it in the post around Galatians 1.16 or so, that you know God from heaven has showed up all of a sudden to Paul and they vanished. Where in the Gospels, you see much more of there's this empty tomb, there's a concrete third day when Jesus appears, he shows up you know, to the women, there's some confusion about who sees what, where, when, and how over 40 days. And women communicate it to the apostles, and, and if they hadn't talked about it, they wouldn't have known about it until at last, at the end of the 40 days, uh, suddenly there's this big event where Jesus is ascended up into heaven. And 40 is, 40 is a really nice even number, very uh, numerological. You're talking about like 40 days in the wilderness, and the 40 days Jesus went out um, in his fast in the wilderness there that's similar to what Moses did. You see a lot of 40-day trials throughout the Bible. It doesn't really seem to be a concrete 40 days, but more like bookends of like, oh, the tomb was empty when the stone was opened, uh, rolled away from the tomb. And then you also, there's the culmination of it in the resurrection, which is kind of like, well, this is kind of the end of things. So, when you look at all the appearances, they all have some sort of like supernatural aspect to them. And I focused on Paul in this first one because um, I think people understand that the resurrection is a supernatural event. Like there's this idea that Christ has risen from the grave. This is a unique occurrence in time history that is not repeatable. There's nothing been like it. There'll be nothing like it potentially until, I don't know, the eschatological 
consummation or whatever you call the, the final coming of Christ. It's something that's really subject to doubt and uh, atypical and not something that's usually open to historical investigation or verification. So it's a very unique uh, situation that has happened here and it's hard to really understand what do we, we make of this event that we've encountered in this uh, visionary experience. So again, thank you for joining in. If anyone has questions or want to jump in and say something, feel free to interrupt me or just let me know you're there. And we're talking about the resurrection appearances. Uh, so you can check out my latest article on it on the postbardian.com. And in this experience here, I'm talking about the visionary experiences that are in the New Testament. So when you get into looking at the actual accounts that we see in the New Testament, they, they have elements to them that aren't things that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And I've lasered in on Paul because when he has this vision of the light from heaven and Christ shines upon him, that he has other people with him. And these other people um, in the first account of Acts 9, there's three of them, uh, three reports that Paul's uh, conversion to Damascus Road is retold. So there's three times in Acts is retold through the Lucan author, whoever that is, that on the first time, it's like the idea is Paul sees it, but his companions don't see it, but they hear something or they hear something, but they don't see it. And then when you get into Acts 22, you see the complete opposite idea of, uh, or is explained as, well, they see it, but they don't hear it. So it's almost explicitly in one account they see and they don't hear, and the other one they don't see and they do hear. So either way you put at it, none of the people that are in his party, his traveling party, are able to see the risen Jesus in the way that Paul sees it. So this isn't like a normal eyewitness account you would see. And if you were to go to court and I'd say, I saw this happen, and... You know, my people who are with me didn't see it happen. I think people would automatically say, oh, you were hallucinating. Maybe you're on drugs or maybe something happened to you that you have some sort of mental illness that caused you to see something that wasn't really there. Based on the fact that it wasn't an objective account. So a big theme here that I really had a hard time explaining is, okay, I think most people see the resurrection isn't like a normal occurrence in history this is something really extraordinary. But there's also the fact that the people who witnessed it, who saw the resurrection appearances, they also observed it in a abnormal way, or almost a paranormal way. And I know that paranormal is kind of a freaky word, but there's also the element of like, some people thought they saw a ghost. Uh, in the case of Paul, one person saw it, the other person didn't see it. Um, it does, it, it's not like your normal Joe Schmo was walking down the road and something crazy happened, like a meteor from heaven showed up and then a thousand people saw it. It's like this person saw it and the other person didn't see it. And there was like an intentionality that it was only visible to the one person versus the other. So if you were to go stick a video camera in front of the empty tomb, like a webcam, you're not going to see the resurrected Jesus sneak out at the right moment because the video camera may film it but the, the event that happened is only visible to eyes of faith so getting into it a little bit further that that, that raises more questions and answers because well does that mean that it didn't actually happen was paul hallucinating did he imagine this did god really speak to him or did he just have this dream or thought he saw something because to be honest, visions and hallucinations are kind of the same thing a lot of the time. And hallucinations are more common than we want to admit. And it makes us uncomfortable admitting that there may be some sort of visionary or hallucinogenic thing going on in any of the resurrection appearances. So, what I'm arguing, based on Wolfhart Pannenberg, Systematic Theology, Volume 2, is that... If you go through all the resurrection appearances, they 
have these elements to them, if you want to call them supernatural, you want to call them um, paranormal, you want to call them anything but typical history, they're there. So that means that when we read them, none of them are straightforward history as far as we can know. There's one account in Luke. I talk about it a little bit at the end of the blog. I kind of leave it open for you to discuss. But in Luke 24, around 36 through 43, there's a scenario that's described that says, you think I'm a ghost, because that's what people see Jesus, the risen Jesus. They think he's a ghost, so paranormal thinking. And Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet. See, it is, it is I myself, touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And then they go on and they give him the, the piece of fish. So Jesus gives a pescatarian uh, situation where he's eating some fish. But you also have to realize that even these uh, instances where he's breaking bread or eating or drinking, there's, there's a Eucharistic background to those things. It's not just purely eating for the sake of eating. It is a sake of validating what they are seeing. But there's also the Lord's Supper is also being communicated there. At the end of Luke, it says, they didn't recognize him until they broke bread with him. And in the breaking of the bread, they recognized Jesus. So they didn't know who this was until they broke bread with him, which is the Lord's Supper. So there's an element, like Robert Jensen recently said before he died, that what does Jesus look like? He looks like the bread and the wine that we break in the Lord's Supper. So when we break the Lord's Supper, in a sense, you and I are seeing Jesus as well. And we are actually having a resurrection appearance as well when we are uh, partaking in communion. But this isn't your normal uh, view of the resurrection that you get from uh, evidence demands a verdict. And it's something quite different than what's often preached, uh, you know, on Easter Sunday. So does this mean that the resurrection was just a hallucination? Um, there are scholars like Rudolf Bullmann and people who follow him that say, well, the death of Jesus caused a crisis for his followers. And the result is that the Easter faith was generated by the tragedy of the loss of Christ. And the resurrection appearances are really the communities, the early, the very first community of the church is trying to come to terms with the loss of Christ and understand who they are. And these resurrection appearances may be uh, generated or the result of people who who believe first and then they imagine them as myth or a saga or some sort of uh, creative liberty to express what they believed. And they didn't actually happen, they're just apostolic myth. That's the phrase of Boltmann. And I think there's some merit to that argument. It's a little bit extreme skepticism, and but I respect a lot of people who take that view. And I can see there's a lot of fruitfulness in understanding the resurrection is something that's relevant to us here and now in a very realized way, and not something that's so future, so much in the future that it has no good or meaning to us today. Um, this is so far distant, 100,000 years in the future that it has no pragmatic purpose. So I think Boltmann is, is very uh, helpful in trying to understand that. But when I kind of circle back to Pannenberg, Pannenberg says, okay, yes, these resurrection appearances, they, they are visionary. They are visions. And to be honest, vision is something that is shameful or doubtful today. But in the time of the, the New Testament, if you had a vision, it, it really would substantiate what you're saying. It would validate what you're saying to other people. So visions were seen as God had actually spoken to you and confirmed what you're saying as an element of confirmation where today it adds an element of doubt. And, but Pannenberg says, even though if I was in a court and someone says they, had a, they saw a ghost, uh, well, maybe there's still something we can learn from those confused witnesses or from the way that they told it, we can still understand what had happened. 
So there, there's kind of like a, a, a nice edge you're walking on a little bit because we can't, on one side, get behind the New Testament and construct a life of Jesus like the historical quest, the questers did, and the quest for the historical Jesus. Um, you know, they, they basically concluded you cannot come up with something behind the kerygma of the church. So we can't really come up with our you know, our own view of what had happened by looking behind them. But at the same time, you know, these aren't eyewitness te testimonies. They're not the same thing that is credible in a law court today. And they create, they contain supernatural, supernatural elements to them. Like I described with Paul, where his fellow compadres uh, weren't, weren't able to see what he saw. So they, they're not straightforward you know, videotaped history. It's not like we're reading the closed caption of a video camera when we're reading the New Testament. But uh, Pannenberg is still very confident, and a lot of scholars like him are, that even though we can admit that the resurrection appearances are uh, best described as visions, they're not necessarily hallucinations. Maybe they contain hallucinations also, or some of them do, but we can still read them and say, okay, there was a reality that happened, uh, a real event that happened, because after the people experienced these resurrection appearances, they walked away saying, I didn't have a dream. I wasn't asleep and woke up and this came to me a dream. I was awake. All the resurrection appearances happened in the daytime. And when they happened to me, I walked away not thinking I had a dream, but that I had actually physically in reality, encountered Jesus who was raised from the dead. And in a way that it would be a problem for me if the tomb was not empty. Not to say that the exact empty tomb narratives are purely historical, but if a body of Jesus were to turn up, that would be a problem for the resurrection appearances. But if they were purely a vision or a hallucination, they would not be a problem. And theologians like Boltmann still think that even if the body were turned up of Jesus, of you-know-who, then the, the, the Christian faith would endure. But I think that for Pannenberg and others, I think it does create a problem. And I think that the problem is good to an extent that we can read those resurrection appearances through the eyes of faith and say, okay, there is a reality behind them that is important and meaningful for us. Okay, so really what I wanted to do with this discussion was not really reiterate everything I wrote. Um, I have two blog posts out there right now that you can go read on the uh that could get you inspired. I really just want to get you fired up to go read the post-resurrection appearances in your Bible. You don't read it, you know, ESV or NIV. Try to pick something a little more scholarly, like a NRSV, or try to read the, the New Testament in Greek if you're able to, because all these translations are ultimately commentaries, and the problem is that a lot of the Bibles that you read today they have this presupposition of inerrancy. I kind of railed on this in my uh, The Ten Errors of Inerrancy series, but there's an example of it with that contradiction I was talking about with Paul in the uh, second uh, report of Acts where it describes Paul's conversion. And if you go read like the NIV or the ESV who have a more of a commitment to inerrancy, they, instead of saying that, you, you know, in the first report that, you know, he, uh, I have to get the order right of them. They're kind of easy to confuse. In, one, in the first one, Versus the second one is a little more clear that one account is saying they heard and they didn't see, and the other one said they didn't see and they, but they heard. So when you go read Acts 22, I think it's verse 9, the NIV uh, and the ESV translate it instead of they didn't hear, it says they didn't comprehend. So, okay, if you, if you didn't hear, you didn't comprehend, I mean, that's technically true. But there's a little bit of a sleight of hand because it says that they didn't comprehend the voice. And if you look at the words between them, the Greek, actual Greek words between Acts 9, 7 and 22, 9, you'll see that one says, 
Um, they did not hear. And in the other one, it used the exact same word for hear, and they said they, they did hear. So if you really wanted to translate it as comprehend, you would have to say, you know, in the first the first one it says they comprehended, and in the second one they didn't comprehend. So really what I'm putting out there is a little bit of caution when you read the post-resurrection accounts because they're so close to the core of the faith that people's uh, biases and presuppositions and pre-commitments are coming into play, that if you see something suspicious or it seems a little bit too neat and tidy, it may be because the translation has tried to cover up the problems that are actually there in the text. So if, if you don't like the NSRV, the NRSV, then you can go to like Bible.cc and you can punch in the verse and you can see the way that all the scholars translated it in the different versions. Like each translation of the Bible is represented by scholars, but scholars always have their own agenda and own objective to it. So in this case, if you really want to get into the, the ink, uh, the, the, I don't know, the nuances, the idiosyncrasies of these different verses, you have to be careful and cautious. And maybe what I'm not saying is to read only NRSV, but to try to read multiple translations of the verses so that you can really try to get your head around uh, what is being communicated there. So I guess what my final note is that I want to leave you with is just because the resurrection appearances are best described as visions doesn't mean that there's not a historical reality behind them that's being communicated through them and in them. So um, the one that I picked on was from Luke. In Luke 24, I talked about a little bit about how Jesus is eating some fish. So that's kind of a, a theme through there. Uh, you know, if you go read Luke 24, you also see it in uh, John 20 uh, is talking about Jesus eating the fish after resurrection. I think that we can really think about those and say, okay, maybe there's truth communicated through the visionary elements or experience that also are linked and inseparable from the historical realities there. And I think if we were to explain them purely as... Um, eyewitnesses in the modern sense that of uh, eyewitnesses that would be trusted in a court of law today, then we, we would lose a lot from what we're reading there. And if we were to see them purely as hallucinations, we likewise would not really understand what really happened to all these different people that resulted in the first Christian community that has resulted in billions of Christians to this day, thousands of years later. So keep in tune. I got two posts done. The first is like, how do we sort out what it means to say the resurrection is a fact of history? How do we qualify that? Because it's not something we can reconstruct or observe. Uh, or And the second one is a little bit getting to, well, what is the genre of these resurrection appearances? Okay, so uh, Richard Keith, you got left me a comment. Thanks for tuning in. You know, got a Harry Potter reference here. A uh, Harry to Dumbledore is all this happening in my head. Dumbledore to Harry. Just because it's happening in your head doesn't mean it's true. I think that's a, a great uh, illustration of what Panaberg's trying to say. And I think uh, he gave me a, a better conclusion than I could have come up with myself. So thanks for listening. Richard Keith, Keith Richards would be proud. Hey, thanks for listening, John, as well. And any of you guys who are in the replay, you watch it and you leave some comments, I'm going to check back on the video over the next uh, day or two. And if you have any thoughts or things come to you or you watch the replay, let me know and I'll try to respond to them in the comments. And feel free to engage with me on those Twitter posts. Facebook posts or write in my blog at postbargaining.com. My name's Wyatt. It's been great uh, getting to know you, talking to you, and I hope to see you in future live broadcasts. So until then, see you next time.